I've completed Assassin's Creed Mirage and I'm going to share some of the things that I'd wish I'd known sooner before playing the game so you can hopefully have a more enjoyable experience in Baghdad. I also won't be giving away any main storyline spoilers here and my thanks to Sylvia at Ubisoft for slinging me across a review code so I could get these tips and tricks out to you very quickly. And let's go over world restrictions first because the game's progression system is based all around the narrative storyline which means you won't be able to unlock or take advantage of a lot of what the game has to offer you until you've got to a certain point. And this is where I would highly recommend that you play through the first couple hours of the storyline until you reach Baghdad. But most importantly, complete a few quests after your arrival until you complete the specific quest that's called branching out. And the reason for this is that all of the world activities, collectibles, gear chests, tool upgrades, assassin contracts, and the whole map for exploration then becomes available for you to explore and collect. And this also means that you can unlock and play the 40 Thieves quest if you pre-order the game before launch. And I'd also really recommend spending an hour or so running around unlocking all of the synchronization points on the map, which I'm going to show you here on your screen, because they were quite difficult or challenging to find compared to other AC games I found. And apart from unfogging the world map, there's always a resource chest inside them, which is going to give you valuable tool resources for upgrades, which we'll talk about later. So definitely worth doing early doors in my opinion. Opinion. So now you've unlocked the full game, so to speak, I'm going to swiftly run you through what all of these icons on your map and what they mean and what rewards they give you so you can decide if it's worth your time and attention outside of the main narrative storyline. The first here is the Tales of Baghdad, which are six world events that touch upon iconic cultural topics of the era and reward you with five skill points for completing them all. We then have the six lost books, which you obtain by solving environmental puzzles and will reward you with a scholar costume and various talismans after handing them all in. You then have 66 individual History of Baghdad locations, which provides you with info on a specific historical location or item in-game for the Indigo Initiate of Alamut costume die. And as well as that, you can also collect 10 mysterious shards in the world to unlock a Isu outfit, sword and dagger, which I'll explain more in detail later on in this video, because the 18 Dervis artifacts you can collect from pickpocketing certain NPCs do reward you with this very cool looking treasure hunter costume, which is a personal favorite of mine. And finally, the Enigmas, which are 12 treasure maps that provide you with a selection of cosmetic talismans and outfit dies to customize Basim with. I'll also have a full no-nonsense walkthrough guides with all of these locations and all of these collectibles we just spoke about coming to you very soon, by the way. So if there's something there that you quite like the sound of, make sure you stick around to the channel because I will have you covered. Don't worry about that. Now, after you've completed the branching out quest, I would highly recommend you do two things. The first is going into your settings menu and turning on the guarantee pickpocket option as this will disable the in-game pickpocketing minigame and also allow you to successfully pickpocket every single NPC instantly without fail. And I then suggest heading to the Grand Bazaar location here on your map and spending 10 to 15 minutes of your time walking around, pickpocketing all the gold and blue pouches that you can see on NPC waste using Eagle Vision. Because when I did this myself, I got 18 merchant tokens, nine scholar tokens, and five power tokens, as well as a huge amount of sellable items that I sold to the vendor for nearly two and a half thousand silver. Now this is incredibly advantageous in the early game because you can use these merchant tokens to reduce vendor prices across the whole map by 30%, which then means that you can purchase resources directly from the vendors to upgrade your tools, outfits, and weapons for a incredibly good price, as well as cashing in these tokens with quest NPCs during important missions that will allow you to bypass rudimentary and quite boring fetch quests in my opinion. And even if you don't want to disable the pickpocketing minigame setting, I'd highly recommend that you do just pickpocket for a short period of time early in the game, as it will genuinely make it a lot more enjoyable for you as you play through the story, cashing in those very valuable Kidmar tokens. Now, as for skills, I can confirm that they can all be unlocked in the game, which is great news. They can also be reset early on as well if you don't like a specific skill that you've unlocked, with the exception being the tool capacity unlocks, which means if you spend skill points to unlock the three tool skills here, you can't then reset your skills or take them back. So it's something to bear in mind for those seven skill points. Now, there's 61 skills in total, with 41 being earned from main quests, 10 from contract missions, five from the Tales of Baghdad quests, and an additional six from the Lost Book collectibles. So you will get your lion's share of skill points 
from just playing the main story, which is how the devs want you to play this game. That said, you will have eight skill points to spend when you arrive in Baghdad, and I would recommend unlocking the chain assassination skill as soon as possible, as multiple enemies throughout the game patrol in pairs, and that kind of takes care of that very early on. I'd also recommend unlocking at least one new tool early on in the game as well to operate alongside the throwing knife, which will allow you a little bit of environmental utility, such as a noisemaker tool to lure guards to you or away from you, or a smoke bomb to disappear when notorious, or alternatively, to assassinate everyone inside it, which is a very overpowered mechanic, by the way. And finally, early-ish recommendation as well here from me would be to spend points to unlock the emergency aim skill, which will allow you to instantly kill an enemy if they initially detect you, meaning you remain in stealth and nobody near you gets notified of your presence, which is very useful indeed, trust me. Now, as for tools, you can unlock all of them by spending seven non-refundable skill points if you include the mandatory auto collect skill that you need to unlock first. But the cool thing about the tools is you can actually change what they individually do from a gameplay perspective by upgrading them at your bureau. And how this works is that you need to unlock three tiers that are associated with each tool, with each tier allowing you to select one bonus effect that subsequently enhances that tool. So for example, I'll need to spend a collective 300 components, iron and leather resources to upgrade my throwing knife to tier three, as you can see here, which will then allow me to create a tool build that is specific to my own gameplay style and how I like to play in this game. So for example, again, I like to play super stealth with my throwing knives. So because of that preference, I'll unlock this corroded knife ability in tier three as it will dissolve the NPC corpses who have just been killed with my throwing knife instead of it just remaining on the floor, which now means that the body has disappeared. So it can't alert patrolling guards, which is a really great upgrade in my opinion. You can also, of course, try out tool tiers and then reset your choices in the tool menu if you decide it's not for you. And I'll again have a best tool and skill build video out for you in the coming days that I'll put at the end of this video, depending upon when you watch this, because I wanna run you through some more important things to know in this video, such as armor sets, otherwise known as outfits, with six in total being unlockable in this game, which is accompanied by an additional eight costumes that if you weren't aware is a transmog option, that means that you can change the appearance of your outfit in the infantry menu without sacrificing its stats or perks in this game. Now, the first outfit you will earn via the storyline and another one through assassin contract completion in the Bureau, with the remaining four outfits obtained by looting gear chests throughout the world and collecting mysterious shards. But there's a catch you need to know here because each gear chest is random. And what I mean by that is there is three gear chests associated with one outfit with the other two rewards in those gear chests, specifically providing you with two schematics that you then spend at the table to upgrade that specific outfit, enhancing its perks. So if you want a specific armor set, or I should say outfit in this game, there is a 33% chance of getting that outfit on your first try in the one of three chests that contains the outfit and two of the schematic upgrades, meaning that you will need to loot all three gear chests in the world that are assigned to that one specific outfit to get it because I looted two upgrade Zanji Rebellion outfit schematics before I actually looted the Zanji Rebellion outfit itself. So this means if you want all the outfits in the game that are then fully upgraded, you'll need to loot nine chests in total around the world. And the same mechanic works here for your weapons where you can obtain an available six swords and six daggers in this game apiece with three daggers and three swords being available in gear chests around the world, which adds up to a total of 18 chests if you want them all with max upgrades with the remaining two daggers and two swords being earned during storyline and assassin contracts. Now they follow the same in-game 33% loot chance rule here, just like the outfits, which means you may pick up two upgrade schematics for a specific dagger after looting the first two out of the three chests, but not actually have that dagger in your infantry as it'll be in that final third chest, depending upon your in-game odds. So yeah, random luck and uh, general time spent is the name of the game here, I guess, but there's also another thing that you need to know because unlike the outfits where you can actually change the look of it by equipping a costume in your infantry, if you want to change the look of your weapons, you'll need to go to a blacksmith vendor to do it specifically, which isn't ideal, but yeah, it is something to be aware of on the customization front there. Now, if you've learned something new or you're enjoying the video so far, please do leave a very swift like down below as it really helps me out, so thank you very much. Now, this Isu outfit is very cool because when you perform an air assassination, a flash of lightning disorientates or a shock 
shockwave disorientates everyone in a 15 meter radius. With the Isu Sword reducing your health by 50%, but contrastingly, it does increase your damage by a whopping 50%, which is quite the trade off. And if you combine that with your Isu Dagger Perk, which heals you by 10% after every fifth hit, it's definitely an armor set for those of you who do fancy storming around Baghdad out of stealth as a glass cannon. But important to note here as well, you can unlock these items individually by collecting Mysterious Shards from roaming NPCs on the map that will then allow you to spend five of those Mysterious Shards for the Isu outfit, three of those Shards for the sword, and the final two Shards for the dagger, bringing it to a total of 10. And when you do have all 10, you can then travel to this location on your map to unlock them. And if you want to get this whole armor set very early on in your playthrough, I'll again have a full video guide up for you very shortly on how to get all of these 10 shards very quickly so you can enjoy your Isu armor and weapons for the remainder of the game. Because that's a good segue onto replayability in this game. Because after you complete everything, there really isn't, unfortunately, anything to do with no new game plus being available either. But we can get around this by being a bit clever with our manual save slots with the total available being 20 because there's six black box missions in this game which you'll complete while progressing through the main storyline where you can take different routes to kill your target but the problem is after you finish it once you can't then replay it and try a different route so to get around this you'll want to manually save your game when you're just about to start the mission and you will know that it's just about to start because this screen will pop up which I'm going to blur here for you here no spoilers incidentally here are the quest names for each specific black box mission so perhaps take a screenshot of these quest names I've just popped up on your screen here so you are 100% sure when you need to save your game which means that you can load that save and try a another assassin route and experience the mission differently a second time round. Additionally I didn't complete any of the 20 available contract missions in the bureaus during the storyline so I made a manual save before starting any of them which means that I can then go back and replay them in full when I want to when I'm kind of streaming online for example because after you complete them for the first time they then disappear forever unfortunately. Now there's a few beneficial options for you to have a play around with in the settings menu to enhance your playthrough. First of all I know a lot of you in the comments in the last couple of weeks have been asking about controller customization and I'm pleased to say that you can do it in this game so you can bind controls to specific moves that you would prefer. There's also three difficulty levels available which can be adjusted at any time as you can see here with an Arabic dub turned on for full immersion if you want it just like in Ghost of Tsushima if you've played that game when you can play it in Japanese and while we're on the topic of immersion you can also turn off your UI entirely if you really want to go full send in this game there's also a nostalgic AC1 filter which you can flick between here if you want to go proper old school with an FPS limit and refresh rate to specifically cater to your setup including a performance and fidelity mode to maximize frame rate or graphical output like a 4k TV or or screen. Now I've got even more tips and tricks for you in the video on your screen right now so give that a click so you can get even more out of this awesome game and I'll see you there in just a second but if you're still here my huge thanks to my co-content creator Nika who has joined me in early access and has helped me scour the game to get the best info for you. Coffee is certainly on her and I'll see you in that next video.